Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, welcome to all of you. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm delighted and grateful to be here. Um, this is not my normal field. I do law, but I'll see what I can do with inequality. Um, we have it on good presidential authority that inequality is the defining challenge of our time. Arguably, it's the, or at least a, defining challenge of all times, profound question that has over the centuries invited deep reflection. Jerusalem had one answer, Athens had another, Hobbes had an answer, Machiavelli had an answer, and a bit closer to home, this country was famously founded on the proposition on the self-evident truth that all men are created equal. In the contemporary debate uh, for good or ill that rages now around us has nothing to do with any of that. <laughs> um, it's about income inequality, and it says that R is greater than G. The returns to capital will always in, um, exceed the economic growth rate, and so the rich get richer and the poor get poorer over time. That is not quite inevitable. During the post-war era, we had uh, what is uh, sometimes called the Great Compression Incomes at the outer ends. But income inequality has increased again since the uh, dramatically since the 1970s or 80s, and especially after the 2008-2009 financial crisis. All the gains from growth have gone to the top 10% or the 1% or whatever. Uh, so surely we should do something about that. Uh, the perplexity I want to explore is, um, I don't think there's a country uh, on the planet or in history that has thought more carefully about uh, and more seriously about equality than America. And what the chattering classes now would have us do is trash that proud, though often tragic, legacy. Um, down to a politics of resentment. Um, inequality, I think, is not a problem. It's a slogan and a very nasty one um, at that. Once you cut to the sort of high-minded burble, there's very little left but envy, which is harmful to your soul and harmful to social cohesion. You can look that up in the Bible, actually. Right? Don't covet your neighbor's cow. Get your own damn cow. <laughs> Supply side economics, if you want, but it's the Lord's economics. Uh, but there are various other ways in which the inequality obsession is kind of quite harmful, I think. First, it distracts from things that are important and interesting about America and the world, and things that have actually gone right. And second, it diverts attention, I think, from real world problems that we might actually be able to address. Um, the condition of the truly destitute, the collapse of our public institutions, and the triumph in our public policies of luxury goods over the ordinary concerns of American citizens. So let me start with the things that I think have gone right, because that helps to keep income inequality in perspective, and it teaches some intriguing lessons, I think, along the way. Um, so forget about philosophy and religion and Aristotle and all these big guns, um, right? You're just bleeding hard. Uh, you have a big heart and you see injustice out there and you hate to see people get hurt. Um, what might you worry about? Um, I'll start, or I'd start with global inequality. Uh, the story here is actually quite good. Um, because by most measures, life expectancy, mortality rates, schooling, abject poverty, and so forth, uh, worldwide inequality has actually decreased over the past decades. There is way too much misery around, yes, but there's some reason for confidence because we roughly know what works. So on that score, be of tolerably good cheer. Or you could be concerned about equal citizenship and the rights that go with it. Surely, though, we've made great strides at that front, and in particular, the past two decades have brought a stupendous transformation in record time. 
And finally, you could worry about social stratification, that is, sort of an un-American class society. My former colleague, Charles Murray, worries about that. The rich, he says, sort themselves into these super zip enclaves, and they get married, and they go to church, and they raise children in stable families, and they don't have any idea of the real America. For example, they can't name a single NASCAR driver. I don't want wrong their own son. I I think there's something silly about that. Um, because the enemy of class is commodification. The mass marketing and sale of what once were luxury goods for the few. And we've had commodification in spades, right? Donald Trump has no more class than any of his followers. He just has more money. And I think that's actually a problem, but not in the, for the advertised reasons. Because if the tastes and preferences are the same, up and down the income chain, and there's nothing you cannot have with just more money, you're looking at a classless society in more than one sense. Um, None of this is to say that there's nothing here to worry about with respect to inequality, but it is to say, I think, that the single-minded obsession with it screens out broader truths. And it is to say that the people, people who peddle politics of inequality blend it out. Not because things have gone right, so that we need no longer worry, um, but because they have to screen it out. Their worldview demands it. Liberals are against free trade, um, at least so far as the United States is concerned. Um, likewise, poor countries need cheap energy to escape their wretched condition. Liberals are against cheap energy anywhere on the planet. If you're worried about the equal dignity of all persons, you should worry about persons who are stuck for a few more days in their mother's wombs and about future generations whom we've loaded up with debt. And liberalism's answer is that these people and their preferences count for nothing. If you're worried about class stratification, I think you ought to worry about the fraying of social norms because the rich have a million ways and dollars to compensate and the poor don't. Liberalism, it's safe to say, isn't very fond of shoring up our, our public mores. So in short, liberalism and the obsession with inequality that it now reflects isn't committed to extending our notions of equality. I think it depends on constricting our horizons, our territorial horizons, our time horizons, our concern over who counts in the larger universe. Right? It puts all of that aside and then screams, what about the Gini coefficient? Um, you should not let these people do math or economics ever. Because even within that constricted universe, the let's fix inequality agenda, I think, is wildly implausible. So as a first cut, it seems to me, you have to be for inequality. I think Karl Marx had this absolutely right. Um, the root of inequality is the division of labor. Right? Without that, we'd be much more equal, equally miserable. Right? It's when we specialize and exchange stuff and make use of our comparative and competitive advantages that good things happen and prosperity breaks out. So as a first cut, you have to let people earn their marginal product. And because people have different endowments, that means inequality. There may be reasons at the end of the day to redistribute some portion of the gains or under some circumstances let people earn more or a little less than their marginal product, but you can't get any of this right unless you get the baseline right. And the baseline is inequality is good, or at least it cannot be bad in and of itself. Right? You can easily imagine a society in which everyone has enough. Not enough to just squeak by, but enough to lead a meaningful life. Would we care if that society had a few gazillionaires and the Gini coefficient ran into the stratosphere? No. Right? Conversely, we could reduce inequality by making America more like Denmark or like Bangladesh. Um, absolute poverty is one thing that's always bad, um, no matter what. Inequality is a very different thing. If it is bad, it has to be on account of some consequences. And even if that is true, 
you still have to figure out whether government can do anything about it uh, realistically and without making matters worse. Um, that diatribe is actually sort of common ground um, across the entire spectrum of political opinion. Right? Even the most ardent apostles of reducing inequalities, or think Paul Krugman, um, they don't propose to e eliminate inequality. They never tell you how much of it would be acceptable. They just say too much of it is harmful, and we've crossed that too much threshold. How do they know that? I don't know. They don't say. Um, so why might inequality be bad? Um, there are theories to the effect that it retards economic growth or that inequality impedes social mobility. That would be distressing if it were true, but the evidence on both of these points is mixed at best. Um, Scott Winship of the Manhattan Institute has a very good uh, literature review in a recent issue in, of, of uh, National Affairs, and you can find that along with reams of stuff on inequality on the Brookings Institution's website. Um, but there is one connection that strikes me as real and really troublesome. Um, and that's the connection between inequality and the deteriorating quality of public institutions. I emphasize connection. Uh, I don't know which way the causal arrows run here, but I think the subject merits quite a bit of attention. So here's one way of looking at this. Um, economic inequality above some point, I mean dramatic inequalities, um, endangers democratic stability. And the reason is that the rich just go and buy themselves politicians and public institutions, which enhance their returns even further. So sooner or later, if that, you let that go on for too long, there'll be riots in the streets. Uh, some scholars have made a very plausible case to my mind for, uh, along those lines. The glitch is that their evidence comes from developing countries. And so that doesn't translate very easily into the United States scenario. And a second glitch with these models is massive endogeneity. Maybe the political system in these countries went bad first. And the rich were just better able to seize on it. Um, I'll come back to that point. Here's another perspective. Um, maybe under some economic and technological conditions, people mar people's marginal products range from practically zero um, to near infinity with very little in between. And you cannot run a decent society with a distribution like that. So even under conditions of perfect mobility, right, rags to riches, riches to rags in a single generation, that isn't going to work because the entire point of a liberal society is to reduce the risk of extreme outcomes, sudden and violent death, right? So the basic idea there is risk aversion. And so why doesn't ca that commitment carry forward into uh, income questions? Uh, these, I think, are serious questions um, posed by serious people. So here's the first connection between political institutions and inequality. Uh, the author I'm going to quote you uh, is moping about a sprawling, mutable government and the unreasonable advantage it gives to the sagacious, the enterprising, and the moneyed few over the industrious and uninformed mass of the people. Every new regulation concerning commerce or revenue or in any way affecting the value of the dif different species of property presents a new harvest to those who watch the change and who can trace the consequences. A harvest reared not by themselves, but by the toils and cares of the great body of their fellow citizens. This is a state of things in which it may be said with some truth that the laws are made for the few, not for the many. This guy has watched way too much Fox News. Um, this is actually James Madison, Federalist 62. <laughs> <laughs> and note the way he runs the argument. Um, it's not that the rich elite starts buying itself its very own government. It's that public institutions that re it's it's that public institutions that reward the rich, or rather those who want to feed on the rest of us. There's no way to escape this, he says, except to limit government's output and to enhance its capacity for deliberation 
as opposed to naked rent seeking, which he says the Constitution will accomplish. The second point. Um, I will spare you the cites um, or quotes because they're from Hegel's philosophy of right, um, which is too Teutonic even for my taste. Um, but here's, here's the argument. Um, free commercial exchange, what we now call capitalism, he says, is the name of the game in modern societies, and you don't want to go back from that because there's real freedom in it. But the returns or the lack thereof might be so extravagantly unequal that citizens might no longer recognize themselves in the government that superintends society, so they become alienated. Those passages is where that theory comes from. Um, the entire th theory that he then uh, propounds is too involved for present purposes. Suffice it to note that uh, Hegel proposes antidotes to a class society and alienation, among them modest poor relief and a sizable class of government employees with middle class incomes who stabilize this society, he thinks. Uh, I want to invite you to consider this uh, distressing hypothesis. We are now living Madison's nightmare, and we have adopted Hegel's last ditch and ultimately implausible solution. Madison's mutable government is plainly ours, and I think his theory, political dysfunction of a certain kind increases inequality is every bit as plausible as the reverse. Uh, you can find in modern, I mean, in contemporary policies, t politics, examples that do look like the filthy rich have bought themselves their own government. Uh, a tax exemption for carried interest for hedge fund managers is one example. But that's not the general pattern. I think it's crazy to think that Dodd-Frank, which was the principal response to the financial crisis was a corporate conspiracy that was foisted upon us by the 1%. That's not how that thing went down. It's just that that statute and the regulatory behemoth that it has spawned provides infinite opportunities for outsized rents. So the income gains since 2008, 2009 haven't just been concentrated in the 1%. They've been concentrated in one sector, the financial sector, which um, as Paul Volcker once said, hasn't invented anything of value since the ATM. And it is very hard to think of a sort of purely economic theory that explains that outcome. And Hegel's government may be ours by now, um, except it's much more dystopian. Um, in the wake of the financial crisis, government employment collapsed. I mean, we lost 600,000 um, public employees and uh, never, uh, it's never fully recovered. And I think it's very hard uh, to my mind to disentangle that, things like that from middle class stagnation and discontent, right? Government, unlike private employers, uh, can afford to pe pay people more than their mar marginal product. It can even afford to pay its contractors and hangers on more than that. And once you cut back on that kind of a uh, government, you're decimating the middle class. And to an alarming extent, John DiUlio of Princeton, among others, has shown um, that class, the American middle class, is now a product of government, not markets. Uh, in fairness to um, Professor Hegel, he never thought that public employment could save a liberal society. His first lines of defense were the family and corporations, or what we call voluntary associations, but those institutions aren't in terribly good shape either. And that disintegration has gone along with the grand expansion of government and its economic role. And in that regard, too, I think, we are now more equal than ever. The poor of this country depend on the government, but then so do my lawyer friends. And hedge fund buddies. Um, who arbitrage in provide arbitrage in regulated industry equity markets. And I myself, uh, for that matter, because behind me, although you can't see it, stands the full faith and credit of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, 
The rents that are earned in these markets aren't pure waste. They provide some value, but they remain rents, and you have to figure out, figure that there's a ton of deadweight loss. You can't run a society like that, at least not a prosperous, confident society. Who, apart from the president and um, a few progressive pundits, believes that income inequality is the defining challenge of our time? Well, exactly 5% of Americans think it's a pressing problem. Um, according to the experts, that number is so low because Americans are indelibly stupid and misinformed. Uh, there's a recent article in the Scientific American of all places uh, that purports to show just how stupid we are and why. Um, and that may all be right, um, but at the end of the day, you have to run elections with the voters you have, not the ones you would like. And so why do the campaign advisors um, still tell their candidates to make hay of inequality? I think because it resonates, not because the voters think inequality per se is objectionable or a bad thing, they don't. But I think it's become shorthand now for difficulties and discontents that are all too real. Stagnating middle class incomes, miserable growth rates, dysfunctional institutions, loss of confidence. So if you ask people whether the system is sort of rigged against the middle class and for the few rich, you get close to 70% approval, and that is bipartisan. So for all their stupidity, the voters may actually be onto something here. Um, so in that light, it seems to me the sort of preoccupation with doing something about income inequality uh, is un counterproductive, especially since we can't do much about it anyhow, at least not in the short term, right? There may be reasons to sort of drive up the marginal tax rates for the very wealthy, but reducing inequality is not among those reasons. Nor can we reverse the secular forces that have increased inequalities, the rise of an information society, and the attendant increased returns to cognitive capacity, or what is euphemistically called the changed family structure. If you simply plot outcomes, uh, income outcomes, against single parent parenthood, you get a 0.6 correlation. You don't get that for any of the conventional inequality variables. I think what we can do, or at least can try to do, is maybe to arrest and ideally reverse some of the things that have that things government has done to make things worse. Um, if you could simply stop stuff like net neutrality or the EPA's clean power plans, I think you'd wring a ton of rents out of the system and remove a lot of uncertainty that hangs over the economy. That may sound like a libertarian or Tea Party program, but it need not be, and I don't think it should be. Right? We could tax carried interest, I mean carried interest as income, because that is what it is, or we could limit the mortgage deduction, um, which benefits wealthy homeowners, and so on. Right? The Brookings Institution, Bill Galson's institution teams with experts who argue that we should focus on increasing economic growth and income mobility, not inequality, and they have various proposals to that effect. Our mutual friend Steve Tellis of Johns Hopkins is running a program that's sponsored by the Kaufman Foundation to identify programs that create pure rents and distribute government, I mean, pr pr distribute them upward. Right, so the program, I mean, the theory, Steve's theory is that that, that program focus on those kinds of policies, upward redistribution, um, that should hold appeal even and especially in a very polarized political environment. I don't agree with all of the policy prescriptions here, um, but these ideas strike me as sort of directionally right. Um, I harbor no illusions uh, that such a project would be easy. In fact, I'm quite skeptical. We can't kill the Exim Bank. What can we get rid of? Right? So the central problem, I think, isn't this or that program or giveaway. It's the general state of our institution, a mutable government that saps people's spirits. Go read Federalist 62. It's an eye-opener. But if we could make a small start here or there, that would be worth something, because at least we'd be 
focused on the right things. Thank you.